uh, I'm excited. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'm just gonna share my screen really quick and jump into into things. Um, let's see here. Um, boom. So, um, hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, how's it look, Bronwyn? Looks good. You're ready. Okay. So, um, so yes, I uh, I manage uh, Baltimore City's Camp Small program. It's a, a it's a, a program within the Division of Forestry, and uh, Baltimore City's Division of Forestry is um, within the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks. Um, so it, you know, um, and we, uh, our facility sits at uh, Cold Spring in 83. Um, so uh, we're sort of in that junction with Polytech and um, the police station is here, um, Silburn Arboretum, uh, we share the woods with. Um, and it's a, a five acre site. It's been, it's been used by the city for as a as a wood dump. Um, I when I first learned about Camp Small, it was because my artist friends would would come to Camp Small and uh, and poach wood, and they they called it the stump dump. So my before I you know ever ever thought I'd be working here, um, I knew it as the stump dump, and. And uh, let's see, I'll go to my next slide. Um, in 2016, um, after uh, probably two decades, 20 years of, of folks kind of, you know, kicking the can on the idea of, of trying to find, trying to create a program, trying to find a way to, to, to capture some of the value out of, out of the material that came to Camp Small. Um, the, the city finally got, got the program off the ground, uh, folks from the office of sustainability with, um, folks from recreation and parks, um, and, um, you know, and a lot of push from the U S forest service, um, close by to us in, uh, in Catonsville, um, there's a, the Northern, um, the urban research field station for the forest service. Um, so it's conveniently located to something like this, and um, you know, and having having that resource close by, and um, and definitely friends, you know, friends within the Forest Service there, um, has really helped with this program uh, get off the ground and 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 be successful. Um, but so the five acre site would would collect materials, um, collect logs and brush and wood chips. Uh, it's those those materials are coming exclusively from city-owned trees. So, so they're coming from uh, your street trees and open park space trees. Um, you know, if it's in a, if it's in a wooded area, wooded park area, that the the log stays in the in the forest to decompose, create habitats, uh, rich soils. Um, if it uh, falls on open park land, it typically comes here, and if it if it's a street tree, it comes here. But everything that we deal with um, is either storm damaged or um, diseased and decayed or just at its end of its life cycle. Um, so you know we're not taking we're not taking uh, walnut trees down because they're valuable, uh, nor will we ever do that. Um, and and you know, I mean, that's um that's a great part about my job and and why I love it the sustainability of it um you know the you know I I I, I cut logs up and from trees and, and turn them into products but um but I love the the trees while they're standing more than the wood that they produce so um as do my colleagues um but we get about nine thousand tons of material a year. Um, that is a whole lot. It's really hard to kind of put that amount of wood into um, perspective, but it's enough to fill a football field 20 feet high um, 
more than once maybe um we get our our facility right now is holding about 30,000 tons of material i'll explain why we have so much volume sitting here right now but um but the material would just kind of collect before the program started it would collect and decompose it was just all mixed together it wasn't ordered um it was just a dumping site and then the city would have to pay a contractor to come in and, and haul that material away um which can be could be a really big expense and that all depended on the markets of mulch basically because most of those contractors that are going to be able to do that effectively and at a low price are you know able in-house to um to process it and turn it into a product but it's a low value product and you know and to make it efficient they're just grinding everything up um so when our program started um you know after those departments got together those um agencies and organizations got together and, and sort of came up with a plan they pitched it to the innovation fund which is a city um it's within city finance it's also tied to the mayor's office and um and the innovation fund is based it's a really unique program that baltimore city has and to my knowledge no other city has and i i talk to a lot of cities about this kind of stuff um it's a pool of money that finance has and so i think it's about um 2.3 million dollars and and agencies departments within the city government can apply for for money from that as a loan as long as you know through a proper um um uh, business proposal they show a return on revenue or a return on investment um and you have five years to pay it back so this program was started by a um a pretty small loan of ninety eight thousand dollars just to just get it going um you know prior to that like there was a lot of studies done i think you know somebody would get it in their head to to really go at this thing they get a study done to see like what was the most viable way to do it um and then probably that person would leave and move on to a different job and that study would never get off the ground and somebody else would come in and do it again and that happened for about 20 years before the program started on this on this loan um so the $98,000 hired brought me in as a contractor um I was able to rent some screening equipment and I put all these decom all those decomposed um, materials through a screener and made a compost um I sold that compost and um and paid back the loan um so the five-year loan was paid back um in about a year and a half um so that really set us up for a good um track record with the innovation fund uh it also immediately showed that the program can be successful um at the time all I had as a machinery was a, a a front end loader so I couldn't really do any processing of the materials I was just looking for for markets of raw material um the mulch market wasn't very interested um in in procuring the the in buying the the materials because you know one thing that we had to do was establish price points on everything everything needed to be sold um and and so I was you know I started working with um you know there's a bowl on this on this slide um so bowl turners can can work from from raw raw materials um I had a chainsaw and a front end loader so I could cut um sitting rounds in the bottom you see some little sitting rounds that students are sitting on um and then I could sell whole logs also in the bottom right you see whole logs on a on a on a truck um and those are going to a small boutique uh, sawmill operation. Um, I could use whole logs for play spaces. So up in the up in the top top right corner, you see a a play space. That's a that's a really well used uh, play area in Baltimore City. It's it's right by the Waverly Market on Thirty Second Street. Um, it's called the um, Abel Abel Street Park, I think. Um, so we were able to start doing stuff like that. Um, I started bringing mulch, uh, making our wood chips available. Uh, we don't have a proper shredded mulch, 
um, but we have wood chips, which are just as suitable for all applications. Uh, they just don't have that same uniform uh, look to them. And of course we don't dye them, um, but, um, but started trying to make efforts to get those in, in more people's hands and make them available. Um, we established pricing on everything, but we also established that raw materials like this, we would do a no cost to any um, community projects or nonprofit work um, projects on public spaces. Uh, so, um, also you, when I first can you say first, that again? Um, you cut yeah, out which oh, about um, about about uh, donating yeah so um so those raw materials um whole logs wood chips um we donate we donate no cost to any projects that are public projects so public property community projects park space and also like nonprofit um to nonprofits so uh, if we're designing a playground with a nature play area it's there's no cost to us to use your materials to the raw materials um there is no cost um it, but the costs that go in are uh labor tied so they're tied to to labor yeah. um and then, and then certain materials we can't give away um because of the demand for them uh and what we're and 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 the limited supply of them um, so white oaks would be like something that, that, that we don't give away, um, large white oaks, but, um, but they keep the costs really low. Um, I'll show you later on, um, some other place based slides and give sense of sense of costs. But, you know, the one that you see here in the upper, in the upper right at, at Able, um, something like that for us to, to cut the logs to length to, to deliver them, to install them, um, it, it's probably about a um, an eight hundred dollar project. Okay. Um, Thank you. But, yeah, but those costs are tied to the labor and the delivery. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, um, that first year that I started. BGE put a substation on the camp small property. So that was a deal that the city had already already done with with our utility company. Um, and so they the woods here at Camp Small are um, silver and arboretum woods, park park parkland. Um, unfortunately, the, the the substation took out two acres of of forest, beautiful forest in the city. Um, and you know that was sort of devastating, and it was also um, interesting to find out that that there was nothing in place on like capturing the value out of standing timber. Um, so, you know, that was something that that right away I wanted to do. I wanted to cruise the stand, um, make sure BGE gives us all of the the usable timber out of out of that project. Um, and that picture in the top left was a portion of the logs that I. That I had harvested out of the stand. Um, as you can see, there's those those dark chocolatey ones. That's walnut. That's black walnut. Um, it's poplar and ash and walnut. Um, and we 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 got about eighteen thousand board feet out of that out of that project of timber. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I knew I knew that you know it had a lot of value, but it, again, I didn't have any way of processing stuff. So the first thing I did was just talk to our capital department and recreation and parks and find out if there's any upcoming projects that could utilize lumber. And um, coincidentally, there was um, the Cahill Recreation Center uh, was just getting underway with the design. Um, they had already budgeted um, $100,000 for uh, for for milled lumber that they were planning on cladding the inside of the building with, um, and I had I had the eighteen thousand board feet that they needed in these logs. So I worked with the local sawmill, uh, Edrich and Windsor Mill, um, to uh, to process all these logs into kiln dried tongue and groove boards, which you can see on that on that flatbed truck, um, and in the other pictures here. Those are examples of that that milled finished wood. 
Um, some of it we had we had made into um, into boards for 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 the fishing piers down at Middle Branch. Um, and then the other shots are interiors of of Cahill Recreation Center, which you know if any of you haven't seen, it's a beautiful facility, um, indoor pool and um, state of the art gymnasium and 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 workout areas and also um, also areas for um, programming and education. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful display of you know what this program could could be and what other cities could do with a program like this. Um, immediately it saved the department um, seventy thousand um, dollars and and is just a, a like I said, a beautiful display of possibility. Um, so I still can't process anything. Um, and and I started, I, I quickly realized that there was way more material at Camp Small than than I was ever going to be able to get rid of whole, and that you know because there wasn't a lot of um, processors in the area that could take those logs and turn them into to lumber and make the lumber available to local craftsmen um, and you know. Um, contractors, developers, um, architects. Um, and and so I really wanted to get get into where we could we could we could do that. We could process the material. Um, and I applied for a grant from American Forests. It was their relief grant, which usually goes into large planting projects. but um, but they're really interested in trying to get into where they were supporting this, um this movement of 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 um urban wood and and so that i was given the the relief grant um of forty thousand dollars and i and i bought the sawmill oh it's a wood miser portable band saw mill an lt 35 um it's a hydraulic mill it's really a one person operation if you have the machines to help you with you know three thousand pound logs um but um so that's our that's our mill there. We did a project um, for the grant where we we made raised beds. We worked with um, a local high school, Carver Carver High, that um, um, Carver Votech, uh, that has a phenomenal wood shop and and wood shop teacher. And so they um, they did traditional joinery on the boards. Um, so there are no fasteners involved. Um, and they, they created the beds. And then we had a real big build day where we used our compost that we produced at Camp Small to fill the beds. Um, and, and there's some other examples of some stuff that, that, that we started doing. Um, here's another shot of our mill. Here I just have some slides of photos and I'll go through and just kind of talk a little bit about those things. Um, so that's our mill. That's that's ash uh, that's on the mill. Um, and then in the in the upper right, that's our kiln. It's a dehumidification kiln. It's a three thousand um, a four thousand board foot kiln, but uh, three thousand is about what you what you get in it. Um, and so that's all ash in the kiln. Uh, to put it into perspective, it's about it's a it's a eighteen foot wide kiln. Um, and so. It's a it's a lot of ash. Um, it's you know a couple layers deep there, um, and and then on the bottom are examples of the kiln dried ash. Um, ash is all we've kiln dried so far. We've we've done five loads. Um, we've sold all of it. Uh, it's it's amazing that you know we we cut it on the sawmill, um, and and then we we would sell we sell like green lumber, so un, not dried. Um, just sawn green lumber. And the base price for that is $2 a board foot. But then we put it in the kiln, we load it up, we close the doors. The kiln takes, um, at that material that's two inches thick, um, the kiln takes about, um, about a month, a month and a half to dry. And, and then it comes out and it's, um, it's doubled in value. We sell it um, for about $4 a board foot. Um, and and so that's like our, you know, our cash cow. 
Um, and there's some other pictures. This is inside our building, which I'm in now. I'm um, down there is like the little white building uh, or like little uh, office space. That's where I'm sitting. I'm in there. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's our our building's forty by eighty. It's a big just metal warehouse that we had insulated. Um, it's a beautiful space camp, small, and, and you know the building has four bay large bay doors, and it's it's really pleasant to have all those doors open and and have such a unique view and be. We're in the city, but um, but it feels like we're so far removed from from the city, and that you know we have the Silburn Arboretum. We share our space. Uh, a wetland is is on Camp Small property, protected wetland. Um, and then the Jones Falls River is just we're sort of sandwiched between the wetland and the Jones Falls River. So, you know, lots of lots of wildlife, lots of migrating birds um, and ducks and uh, all kinds of things come through. All kinds of birds nest in the area. Um, we see goldfinches and orioles and bats and um, night herons and blue herons and bald eagles. And um, uh, it's a really unique space. Um, and then, and then the bottom corner, that's an up, up close look at the ash. So, um, so we get a lot, we, we only do ash and we get a lot of ash because of emerald ash borer. Um, so, um, I'm sure most of you, um, have probably heard of emerald ash borer by now. Uh, it's decimating or decimated the ash population in the United States. Uh, it's everywhere. When I first started in 2017, uh, we were still sort of trying to, um, you know, keep ash from moving across state lines, um, keep it separated from other wood that came into the yard. And then it was just, it doesn't matter anymore. It's everywhere. Um, um, Baltimore City did uh, proactively treat a bunch of uh, sort of the champion ash trees throughout the city. I think 400 ash trees were treated and they've kept up with those treatments. They need to happen every couple of years. Uh, and it is an expensive cost um, to do it. But um, but we get a whole lot of it. And, you know, um, sort of a good thing about it is that um, the EAB kills the tree, um, but the wood inside stays um, uh, solid. It doesn't compromise the integrity of the of the wood. Um, EAB uh, just bores into the cambium layer. Um, so underneath the bark, you can see all these little squigglies, um, and that's, you know, when, when it comes out, it, um, kills the tree by killing its, suffocating its lifeline. Um, so it's a beautiful wood for woodworking. It's a straight grain. Um, it stains really well because of how, um, neutral the color is. Um, it's a, it's a really pleasant wood to work with. Uh, for furniture, for basically all wood work, working um, applications. It's also the, the wood that, um, you know, baseball bats are made out of. And it's also the wood that um, uh, most tool handles are made out of. Um, of course, you know, hickory is, is, is used a lot, but, but ash is, is predominantly used. Um, Ace Hardware, you know, uses ash for all their handles. So, um, boom. Uh, here's an example of some stuff that we do. Um, we no longer do these these hex benches um, and hex stools, which is unfortunate because they are they are so cool. Um, they're really they're really awesome uh, and pleasant to look at, but they're very difficult to make. So <laughs> so we we stopped making those. Um, uh, but the cube stools and cube benches, uh, tapered bench, I think maybe I have some pictures coming up with some of that stuff. Um, and we have a website with our product and pricing list on there. And you can find our website just Googling uh, Camp Small or, or Tree Baltimore. Tree Baltimore is uh, is sort of an, um, 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 it's a program within forestry uh, that, um, that, you know, spearheads and orders, orders the, the, the 15,000 trees that get planted through the city every year by mostly by a lot of our planting partners like the Tree Trust and Midtown and um, Downtown Watership. Um, but uh, um, 
but yeah, on on that website you can you can find our pricing. Um, and then these are these are all white oak. Um, you know the we sort of we separate um, and sort our materials that come in uh, based on species. Um, you know, all of our outdoor stuff is rot resistant wood. So uh, white oak, the heartwood is rot resistant. The sapwood um, deteriorates and, and decomposes um, pretty quickly, but um, but the heartwood of white oak will last a very long time. Uh, it doesn't like to be in the ground. Um, and that's why this, uh, this bench is on mulberry feet. Um, mulberry is extremely rot resistant and, uh, and can be in the ground. Uh, it can be buried and you pull it out 10 years later and it's fine. Um, and other rot resistant species that we that we have are um, the locusts, black locust, uh, honey locust, um, and um, cedar, which we have very little of, um, cypress, which we have very little of, um, and Japanese zelkova, which we have a lot of. The zelkova tree was was brought over um, after Dutch elm disease. Uh, came so in the 60s, uh, Zelkovas came over and, and and were planted widely through the city. If you're familiar with uh, Gwynn's Falls Parkway uh, by Mandalmin out to uh, out to Gwynn's Falls Lincoln Park, that um, that parkway is full of Zelkovas. They're they're a beautiful tree, big canopy. Um, they have like a weird kind of diseased looking bark, sort of kind of like a sycamore. Um, but the wood is is fantastic and it's gorgeous. Um, and it's planted in Japan. Um, you know, it's forest for in, in forest stands and um and harvested and and you know mass quantities and used for uh, fishing piers and boats and um and so in, in that setting they grow tall and straight and they grow really fast, even though they're exotic dense wood. Um, but here in, on street trees, they unfortunately they grow about five feet and then they they branch out. If you're familiar with them, they branch out into like 12 to 15 limbs after five feet, which creates a beautiful tree with a beautiful hourglass shape and canopy. But you know, something interesting that that we're thinking about now with programs like this is you know, all these trees come down. And we should be thinking about them while they're alive, um, as to to prune them, to maintain them, so that we're able to capture the the highest value of that material when they do die. Um, and you know that was never previously really thought of. Um, so programs like this are now sort of bringing that discussion to the table, and so practices are are likely going to change and it's not just how we maintain the trees but also what trees do we plant you know um obviously a lot of consideration goes into that with with um you know soil and 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 drought and climate and all those conditions in urban settings um but also uh you know we should be thinking about um does it do we want to plant trees that that have higher purpose when they when they die, higher value and use, because the mulch market is completely flooded, and and it's just not it's not it's a nice thing. Mulching is a nice thing, and sometimes it's it's a uh, very valuable but uh, beneficial. But wood chips are a byproduct that is inevitable, um, and so you know, in my opinion. We should be using more wood chips, which if you saw the mound of wood chips I have right now, you'd probably agree. Um, we have probably on hand about 4,000 cubic yards of wood chips, um, which becomes a fire hazard, which um, I am really going off track here. But let's go back to products. Um, so uh, so more, more uh, examples of bowl, like I showed that bowl earlier, you know, we sell a lot of material to bowl turners. Um, there are a lot of bowl turners. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun thing to do. Um, if any of you are interested in, in bowl turning, there's also a, a local uh, bowl turner named Mark Supic who has a, has a great shop. He's extremely skilled. Um, 
and he does classes. So, uh, and I think like Station North Tool, Tool Library has lathes and do classes, um, and maybe even OpenWorks. Um, those are both Station North Tool Library and OpenWorks are our local maker spaces um, that that are great programs. Um, so if you want to get into woodworking or or are into woodworking but don't have the the space, um, those are great places to look at. Uh, but um, but we sell a lot to bowl turners. This uh, the piece that's on this on this cube stool is a uh, is a spalted maple. Um, so so it has a beautiful effect. I wish I had a I had wish I had a picture of a bowl that was made out of, out of the spalted maple that a customer made. It's absolutely gorgeous. But um, it's a fungus that happens um, during the during the decay of the tree, and um, and if you Captured at the right time, the the wood um, you know still has its integrity, and and it has a beautiful pattern, um, but it's a it's a it's a fungus, um, similar to ambrosia, which happens in maple as well. Um, but the amb ambrosia is introduced from a beetle, um, the ambrosia beetle, and uh, and it bores into the wood, but um, but it carries with it a, a fungus. Um, and so it's sort of an interesting relationship where the, the fungus um, enters the wood and softens that wood. And so when the larvae comes out, um, you know, it's it's easier to for it to eat the wood. Um, but the uh, um, but the ambrosia also that fungus creates, it's called, it, some people call it ghost maple um, because of the look of it. It grays it out and makes it very streaky. Uh, it's also very unique and sought after. Uh, and that's something that's, you know, special to urban wood is that it gets so many more of these characteristics, so much more crotch wood, so much more uh, fungal uh, characteristics, um, so much more burls. Um, and you know, and you can't you can't find that stuff um, easily, but it's 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 we have a lot of it here at Camp Small. Um, it, it's it, you know in urban settings there's a lot of it. Um, the bench at the bottom is our tapered our tapered log bench, and that's all one piece bench. Um, this one in particular is is made out of zelkova, so that's a example of what Japanese zelkova looks like. Um. I, I say we a lot um, during this, um, and when I say we, I, I specifically mean um, myself and my uh, Camp Small counterpart, who is Nicholas Oster, who joined us um, three, two and a half years ago. He has a, a woodworking background and was a woodshop teacher for um, about a decade before he joined us over here. Um, so he brought a lot of knowledge with him on on you know craft and and building. Um, he has experience uh, with um, um, timber framing, and so um, dealing with green wood and joinery methods with green wood. Um, so he started right away thinking about what kind of products can we offer um, other than the kiln dried lumber. You know, products that things that we can make out of green wood. And when I say green wood, it's um, you know, there's a lot of water in, in trees um, and that water retains. I mean, in a white oak, you know, the, a log can be sitting for 10 years. And if you put a moisture reader to it, you know, it's likely to still have 30% of water um, or 30% moisture content inside of it. Um, so, um, so if you try to work with wet wood um, and you fasten it or you glue it as it dries, acclimates to your in you know the the temperature in your home it's going to it's going to move it's going to crack because wood shrinks and so it's going to crack it's going to cup it's going to twist it's going to bust that glue seam it's going to um it's going to shear your screws that you used um and so you kiln dry wood to get all that water out um generally you try to get it down to seven percent moisture content that's sort of typical six to eight uh, if you go to Home Depot and you buy a piece of wood, it probably is like 13% because by that point, it's already sort of uh, acclimated. Um, our relative humidity moisture level here in Maryland is about 13%. Um, 
So, you know, if we cut something and put it in the kiln and it's take it down to 6%, but then it's sitting in our shop for a little while, it's going to, it's going to start going up in its moisture level. Um, but anyway, you know, Nick, Nick was able to come up with some great ideas of things that we can do with wet wood. Um, and these raised bed kits uh, were a great idea. Um, so they're like, you know, halfway assembled pretty much all cut ready to go and you just put the pieces together and put the screws through and this is what you've got um so we sell these raised bed kits um for i think 170 dollars um and the posts in the in the corners are are black locust and the rest of it is white oak uh, we have this one is still sitting in front of that door um, it's our little garden vegetable at camp, a uh, uh, garden bed at camp small. And, uh, and it looks fantastic. And it's been, it's been two years, but they should last about 10 years, which is longer than, you know, the one that you buy at Home Depot that cedar will last. Uh, we do nature play spaces. We love doing nature play spaces. Um, it's so much fun uh to you know we usually get to get a hand in the design um and you know we usually install them um we now like in the upper left you can see that we like cut steps and stuff into the logs to just kind of make it more approachable make it more fun for the kids we'll cut platforms for them to jump off of safely uh you can see an example in that back um that that top left corner of our mushroom uh tables that we do just a big log slice on a big log round with seating around it. Um, those are some of the hex benches in the back. Um, all of these photos were taking, taken at um, at uh, Baltimore City Charter School, Charter Elementary School, um, and we we got to do a really a really nice um, outdoor classroom slash play area there. Um, and again, you know, all this material is rot resistant. So, you know, the 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 play logs are locusts and um and zelkova and mulberries. And then this uh climbing structure out of the hexes that we no longer do <laughs> um is uh is all white oak. Uh, those are some examples of our benches, and that's our post bench that we do next to the square log bench. Um, and this other photo is really fun. We started uh, last year working with the Maryland Zoo, um, so we do we get to do a lot of uh, a lot of build projects for the animals at the zoo, working with the working with the zookeepers um, to identify what species they like. Um, and, and what's suitable for them. Uh, this winter, we're gonna be building a giant play space for the goats in the goat corral at the zoo. And we're looking to build a big play space for the chimpanzees. Um, but we like, we provide big logs for the elephants and the rhinoceros, and um, we provide hollow logs for, you know, the porcupine and, and some of the smaller um, mammals to play around in. Um, it's a really it's it's it kind of came out of nowhere and it's been been really pleasant. We got to tour the the zoo with some of the zookeepers and 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 get to meet the animals uh, up close. It was nice. Uh, here's just some some numbers. Um, we've uh, converted over five thousand tons of of wood into into higher value products. Um, so that. You know that number again, like kind of just shows the impact that a program like this can can have. We're a two person operation, um, so it's not like it's a big expense for the city. Um, you know, we um, the the department does, of course, uh, you know, aid us financially in, in procuring things that we need. But um, we've continued to receive funds from the Innovation Fund, um, and we just pay them back through our revenue. Um, and, and so we're pretty self-sufficient in, in most ways. Um, we are, we've had a lot of publicity. We're, we're sort of, you know, um, a leading example across the nation of a program like this. Uh, we are maybe still the, 
the, the only city that that does all of this kind of work in-house. Um, a lot of cities have have started programs like this, but it's through a lot of public private partnerships, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and we didn't really need to do that because Baltimore City's uh, has a unique structure for sale of goods. Um, a lot of cities can't sell their goods um, to the public, but um, but Baltimore City has a has a thing called public surplus, uh, which what I heard is it's, it was sort of developed uh, for the sale of uh, the cobblestones when they started taking up the cobblestones a hundred years ago. Um, and you know, saw them as a valuable thing, so they started the public surplus. Um, so we, our our goods are considered city public surplus, and we are expected to try to get the highest value out of that material. Um, so it's allowed us to to do a lot of this 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 work in house. Um, but we work with the uh, uh, cities across across the country to to try to implement programs like this, um, and. And um, yeah, um, and where we're going, um, the big the big next step for us is a workforce development program. So we are looking to train uh, six people a year. Uh, each person would be with us for six months, and they would get um, woodworking skills and heavy equipment skills and certifications, um, just to open more windows and doors for them. Um, we'd be working with city residents. Um, I mean, mostly with employment barriers of uh, of some kind, and um, and and yeah, just giving them a lot of a lot of a lot of skills. Uh, obviously, the heavy equipment skill is is something that would open the most doors for them. Um, you know, Nick and I are getting trained from our Department of Public Works to be certified heavy equipment trainers, and then we would we would give those those folks. Um, uh, several months of training on excavators and front end loaders and skid steers because even though I started with a front end loader, I now have a lot of really cool toys here at Camp Small. We've got um, a really a really fantastic excavator with a articulating 360 grapple that makes our work a lot easier. And then we have a machine very similar to that skid steer in the bottom bottom right corner. Um, and and then a lot of partners that we work with. Um, so there's so much stuff that I did not talk about, but I feel like I talked for a good amount of time. Um, so I'm, I'd love to uh, hear any questions that anybody has. Um, one thing popped in my head at the end, and that was that um, the Camp Small, the, the name of Camp Small, I'm also often asked where that name come from. Um, it's uh, from Civil War. Uh, this was a civil war camp, so um, uh, this 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 area was clear cut uh, at that time, um, and uh, the 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 light rail uh, runs right behind, right through our right through our um, our facility basically, um, and at that time that was running a lot of ammunition. Um, they were running ammunition lines. So they set up camps every 15 miles uh, from here to York, PA. And uh, and this was one of those camps. Um, and the history of it's really cool because the, um, uh, the uh, I don't know what the correct term would be, but, um, but the unit that was here um, had, they were sort of like, um, they styled themselves in a way that was similar to to the French, and that their their like attire was very unique, and their like style of marching and displays were very um, sort of flamboyant. Um, and so, people in the community, which this was this was all sort of sailcloth and mills all up and down here. Um, so there's you know there's a lot of a lot of community even back then in this area because of the river uh, and they would come and, and just picnic on the lawn and watch watch the uh the units do do uh fancy fancy uh um marches <laughs> all right i'm done talking unless somebody has questions <laughs> all right sean that was great i was i was gonna ask how did camp small what is what does camp small mean i thought it was you know, a, a Boy uh, Scout camp or something.
Uh, you can come back and, and unshare and we'll do we'll do Q and A. Um, Kathleen has said this this information has revised my opinion of the stump dump. Thank you. Nice. Truly impressive. Nice. And we Thank have you. also William, uh, let's see, who was it? William is definitely interested in, his, in your bowl blanks. And he wants uh, uh, green because he uses a pole leaf. Oh, yeah. Um, that's great. Yeah, we have, we, have, we have them in stock right now. And we in the next month, we'll be doing another run. But right now, we have uh, black cherry and walnut bowl blanks. And those are, you know, we do uh, we do as much as we can sort of ahead of time, but as a two-person operation, our job list right now is big jobs. We're out till February um, and uh, small jobs like cutting up some log rounds into blanks, um, we can squeeze in. So, you know, if there's something else that you wanted uh, for bull blanks, you can let us know. Uh, we're, by, we're by appointment only. So if you shoot an email or call, um, you know, we'd be happy to have you come down and walk around, give you a little quick tour, and uh, and show you some species that could be used for for whatever whatever your uh, project is, your needs are. Well, we have Julie is asking. Uh, I, I think she's a landscape architect working on some parks in the city. And how do we bring you in to work on nature play areas of our parks? Very cool. Um, so. Uh, so we've done a lot of nature play areas and outdoor areas throughout the throughout parks and in community spaces. Um, it's really simple. You just um, just call or email and we'll start off that way. Um, you know, the conversation will be you let him, letting us know what you were thinking. And then uh, and then we could sort of ballpark what what that would look like cost and time. Um, and and then it, me coming down to the site and seeing the site, doing a visit with you to um, to look and, and see what, you know, if it's feasible, what is feasible. Um, right now we're having conversations uh, with the department um, and, and just trying to make sure that, you know, play spaces are, that we are, that we are helping to design and implement. Um, don't breach any sort of um, playground standard stuff. Um, so, um, you know, those conversations probably should have happened years ago within the department to figure that out. Um, but fortunately we are having those now and figuring that out now. Um, and it's not really going to change much about the, the process. Um, it's a pretty streamlined process at this point. So we'd love to, we'd love to, um, to help you and, and, and help the, the city get more, more outdoor play areas. Yeah. John, can you put your um, your email, the best email, in the chat box? Uh, so folks that are on here can have that yep. for us. Um, and Richard asked, do you still have time to do artistic and fun things with wood in your job? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, one thing that's great about being a, being an artist um, is that you know you. Uh, and, and and you don't have to be an artist, but you know, art is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in everything. So it's just it's just a state of mind. <laughs> um, so you know, I keep that uh, I keep that state of mind with me um, with most things. And you know, it's it's all about um, having a problem and solving it, right? I mean, that's what it is, and this this job is certainly that. Uh, it's lots of problem solving. And I get to work with awesome materials um, every day, and you know the excitement of of uh, of opening an old log uh, with gnarly gnarly log that's got lots of stuff going on, and it doesn't look like it's going to be good for anything. And then we cut it open, and it's beautiful. And you know, Nick and I joke all the time here about how every log we cut up is the most beautiful log we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and it's just a, it's a, it's really is a part of the excitement um and outside of that i i do i do still get to do art at home and i got two little ones and i'm constantly doing art with them too so thank you thank you for uh your concern and care there are quite a few <laughs> green woodworkers in uh in maryland um doing spoons and bowls and doing everything Primarily with human power versus uh, versus lathe power power lathe or something like that, and uh, 
it seems to be growing every year. So um, maybe I can get try to try to get a group of them together. Maybe we can come and go get a tour. I think that'd be great. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah. yeah, we could do it. We could do a really fun, fun tour and demonstration. You know, we could even get the sawmill out. Um, you know, if it was something, you know, we've had tours come through where they, um, you know, somebody will come out that's like kind of leading the tour and they'll pick a log and uh, and we'll cut the log with the group and then they take the material home. Um, but we could do it a number, any, any number yeah. of ways, you know. Yeah. We have some really talented people. I'm not one of them, but I enjoy the, the hobby and have a lot of fun with it. So thanks. Absolutely. So um, I, I don't know if everybody else was kind of surprised. I mean, you would you think of Baltimore, the city, we would talk to, you showed, I showed that picture of downtown Baltimore and we do the geology tour of the rocks and the monuments and this and that. You don't really think of trees. I know that we have beautiful parks like uh, Druid Hill Park and Lincoln Park in the city that, that do have trees, but you're not taking the trees from there. And so, I mean, is there, are you working yourself out of a job or, or, or are there, is there a constant supply? Is, a, is there, I didn't know that there was this many trees in the city that you're working with. Yeah, yeah, those, those are great, great, great points. Um, I am definitely not working myself out of a job. <laughs> definitely not not even close to that. Uh, we have we have way more material than we can tackle. Um, and you know, we see it as a this as a really easy right now we 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 bring in about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, the two of us through our, you know, and that's not including um like cost savings that we're providing to community because it would be much greater if we included all the savings that we provide to folks. So just the revenue, we bring in $150,000. Um, and, you know, this program could easily bring in 400, half a million dollars and have a permanent six person staff. Uh, at that point, um, we would we, we would be ready to open our doors and start taking in stuff from the private sector. Um, you know, this would be a very convenient location for, for arborists and private companies to drop off material. Um, so, you know, sort of the sky's the limit um, with, with something like this. And, uh, you know, and, and, and at that scale of things, we're just very much at the bottom, um, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's really fascinating and wonderful to see um, a program like this ha have such an impact and be able to do so much with so little. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about our growth and, and I've mentioned, you know, other cities that are, that are doing it. And I'm really excited to see, see their growth and see the directions they go in. Well, that was an earlier question is where does the revenue go? Yeah. So, um, so with the innovation fund, the revenue goes back into paying the innovation fund, but, um, and, you know, since we started, the program we've just kind of been been paying back the innovation fund. Um, I think that you know I just I just emailed um, um, uh, my uh, my colleague at the innovation fund committee to say could you check our balance because I think we are paid full. And so at this point, now that we're paid full back, um, that revenue will go into into forestry and into Camp Small. So. The revenue is going to allow us to grow. Um, it's gonna, and then, and then it's also gonna be used for planting additional trees throughout the city. Um, so it's a full cycle, you know. We forestry uh, plants the trees, provides the trees, uh, educates um, community on on how to maintain trees through their uh, tree keepers program, um, how to fight invasive invasive management through their uh, weed warriors program. And if you're not familiar with those programs and you're interested to learn more, um, the Tree Baltimore website has has information on those, and those programs are open to the public and they're free and they're wonderful. Um, and and now you know now the Division of Forestry and Tree Baltimore also um, you know is finding innovative ways to use that material once it's down and use the revenue to 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 support that cycle. And Richard wants to know how old is the oldest trees you've dealt with? 
Uh, real close to 300 years. Real close. Uh, 280, um, right around 280 years. White oaks. Um, white oaks right now are suffering a blight. Uh, it's, you know, you go around, you see all these dead, dead white oak trees. Um, I don't really, I can't really speak um, too well on, on what's causing it, but, uh, but I think, you know, uh, not generic, but the generic term is uh, global, global warming is causing it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it seems like it's a, been affecting more urban areas than 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 sort of um, forested areas, um, and so you know it's soil conditions and heat heat island effects um, are are killing killing our white oak. So we've seen a massive amount of white oak trees come down from the blight um, the last two years, and uh, and some of those some of those were were around when the city was founded. You know. What's the lantern fly doing to the trees in Baltimore? If you've heard any impact, I don't know what it's. I don't really know what impact it's having on the on the trees, uh, but I know that they are pain in my butt here at Camp Small. They're constantly flying in my face, and they're all over the place, and I got to deal with like you know, um, you know, moral questions of whether or not I'm going to stomp every single one of these things or at some point, you know, do I just like let them go and enjoy it, you know, like have, have a good time because me killing one every day isn't going to do much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, do, uh, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I've kind of heard mixed things about the effects that they're, they're gonna, that they're gonna have. Um, you know, I, obviously they're not good for our trees, but whether or not they're going to be um, um, having such an impact where, you know, they're they're dying and we're seeing an influx of material come into Camp Small, I don't I don't think so. All right. Any other questions for Sean tonight? Well, thank you so much. So, uh, this is so exciting. I am I, I'm thrilled. Oh, store hours. Kathleen wants to know when, when, when can we go to your store? Uh, if you want to come by, uh, we'd love for you to come by. Uh, it's by appointment only. So you can send an email um, to, uh, to me or uh, I put my email in there, spreston at baltimorecity.gov. You can also send an email to campsmall at baltimorecitygov.gov. Um, and that would be viewed by me and my colleague, Nick, um, and the hours in the email, you can just say, can I come by Tuesday at whatever time, um, Monday through Friday, nine to four. But we have to get you now out to our museum so you take a look and then I want to, and then I want to come back out to Camp Small. I want to come see you. All and, right, let's do that. And keep this, yeah, keep this conversation rolling. Um, we're, I'm, I'm super, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about what you're doing and where you're taking, taking this project. So kudos to you and your team. Um, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, feather in the cap of, of Baltimore. And we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and I think that we need to let everybody know about Camp Small and uh, we'll help uh, help this process, this closing the, the circle, closing the gap, a whole mm -hmm. lifetime, looking at the trees from where we're planted to where they're gonna go um, after they come down. It's wonderful, it's a wonderful, philosophy that we need to take a look at, not only with trees, but with everything that we utilize um, yeah. as well. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, stay well, stay curious, stay outside, uh, stay cool or stay hot. Uh, enjoy the heat because then it'll get cold and y'all be complaining about the cold. So enjoy the heat right now while, while we have it. And then I hope to see you at some of our programs, uh, either online or in the field or in, at the museum. So take care, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Bronwyn. Good night. Yeah.